Hey there, everyone. Welcome back to A View from Earth, brought to you by the Fisk Planetarium at CU Boulder. We hope you're doing well and staying safe. As with the rest of the university and many public spaces around the world, Fisk's theater is closed to the public for the foreseeable future due to the COVID-19 epidemic. However, we are still so committed and excited to bring astronomy education to you that we've started a whole host of online offerings so that we can stay connected and keep bringing the Fisk content that you know and love to you. Plus some new stuff like this podcast. So thanks for tuning in and learning with us here today. Uh, my name is Colin Sinclair. I'm a student at CU going into my junior year in astronomy. I also do presentations at the planetarium when the building is open. And I have Tara here. Hey, Tara. Hey, Colin. I'm Tara. I'm a planetary scientist and a CU alum. I'm also a presenter at FISC and our outreach coordinator and, of course, co-hosting our podcast here. Tara's a, a pretty cool person. So, <laughs> sorry. So, uh, today we're going to be talking about the moon, what it might take to live there and work there, uh, with doctors Margaret Landis and Paul Hain. Uh, I think this is going to be a really exciting conversation, but first, the news. And here to bring us the news today is our friend Joe. Hi, Joe. Welcome back. Hey, Tara. How's it going? How's everybody yeah. doing out there? All right. Well, hello again, folks. Uh, Joe Zader here. I'm a presenter at FIS, studying at CU. Uh, I've got a few uh, bits of news for you today about that uh, big natural satellite in the sky, our moon. Um, now, you're hearing more and more about how we're going back to the moon and the plan to stay there this time. Uh, lots of people, of course, are working on many questions we'll have to answer as we work to establish uh, more permanent, sustainable habitats for us uh, fragile humans down here. Uh, we'll have to overcome, of course, many technical challenges, create new technologies. Uh, but one thing to always keep in mind are the logistical economic and, and economic issues of uh, moving any resources from Earth a uh, whole quarter million miles all the way to the moon. So basically, the more usable raw materials that we can harvest from the moon, the better. And uh, it takes less time, takes less money. Uh, we're not relying on a supply chain that requires the risk of constant rocket launches. Uh, it's just, it's, it's more efficient, more sustainable. Uh, so what's the news now that can help with us, uh, help this uh, kind of situation out? Well, there are two recent tidbits actually, uh, both from the past month or so, and they both have to do with what resources we might be able to tap into on uh, that big barren rock up there. Uh, first, Back in June, uh, researchers in Florida, supported by NASA funding, released a new geological model called the Ice Favorability Index. And basically what this boils down to is that it's the first lunar version of what mining companies uh, do here on Earth. Uh, by studying geological processes, refining their data with different core samples around the Earth, uh, we figure out the best places to dig for whatever sort of resource we're after. Uh, this new model is really the first crack um, at, well, albeit without core samples, of course, because we're not on the moon uh, again yet, but uh, it is the first model to, just to, to, uh, to suggest where the best places to look for water ice in the moon are. And this, of course, will help us know where we can then harvest water. Um, this is hugely important for basic human survival. Obviously, we need water um, and oxygen and uh, transporting from Earth all that water and oxygen that a colony might need uh, to be sustainable and to survive is really impossible. So um, that, that's, of course, hugely important for our survival. But in addition, the water is massively important because you can separate the, the water molecules into hydrogen and oxygen. And that, of course, then can provide rocket fuel. Uh, once the infrastructure is in place, uh, you can use mapping models like this ice favorability index that came out and help us to turn the moon into a hub for fuel. You can really imagine it being like the humanity's first space-based gas station in a way. It uh, could allow robotic craft or human explorers to uh, uh, stock their supplies up before heading out to Mars or Europa or uh, to maybe to mine an asteroid for different uh, precious metals. And uh, so it's kind of a, a cool thing to think about, but uh, actually speaking of uh, the metals, like the, on the asteroid there, uh, it's kind of a good lead into this other story I want to mention uh, that came out, uh, I think it was uh, beginning of July. Yeah, it was beginning of July. So uh, uh, NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, or uh, also known as the LRO for short, since there's uh, nothing at NASA that doesn't get an acronym. Uh, it's, of course, already been a great workhorse, done some excellent science over the years. Uh, but it's not done yet. 
the um, instrument called the mini RF or radio frequency uh, recently found that below the surface of the moon, there's a lot more metals like iron and titanium than we had originally imagined. Um, now I should note that these studies, uh, they actually have a lot of uh, possibly have implications for how the moon was formed and could challenge some of our formation models, which was kind of the main thrust of this, uh, of these studies. Uh, but for this little segment, I wanted to highlight the practical need for this metal, uh, which exists really independent of however the, uh, metal was formed. Uh, <clears throat> so simply put, all this metal down there means there's no need to transport these resources from earth. Saves a lot, uh, like I mentioned before. Uh, so you can kind of imagine um, with all this uh, metal there, all this ore, you can imagine swarms of autonomous mining robots. They're crawling across the, uh, the moon. They're uh, harvesting this metal. Uh, they feed the ore into, you know, maybe like a low gravity uh, 3D printer that's building the scaffolding for different uh, human habitats and things like that. Um, so it's, it's um, really providing a lot of, uh, setting the stage, I guess, for uh, what we could do as a colony up there. And uh, with that amount of metal that we keep finding year after year and big caches like this, uh, it's looking a lot more feasible to efficiently construct some infrastructure on the moon uh, once we get back there, of course, which hopefully will be very soon. Uh, so I think there's some exciting things happening with uh, possible resource uh, uh, finds and resource management on the moon, which would help uh, help our species to start getting out there into the stars more. Sick. Thanks, Joe. Those are some pretty cool stories. Yeah, good. I'm glad you liked them. It's uh, pretty cool. It's just amazing how much we keep finding and uh, the possibilities of what could happen over the next decade or so, you know? One of the things that we talked about uh, in an interview that is for this week, which is kind of weird because the time is all backwards, but we talked with one of our guests about, you know, the the uh, the kind of, what's the, what's the right word? I want to say the pristineness of the ice on the moon and how it's probably, a lot of it could, you know, be uh, polluted, so to speak, you know, with other stuff that's on the moon that would make it not, you know, immediately available for human consumption or using, you know, to grow crops or anything like that. Um, and so that's interesting. It sounds like, you know, that's kind of on the minds of some researchers saying, okay, we have to figure out which of this ice is, is more viable than the other ice and how can we kind of work with that information. Right, yeah, that's that's spot on. I think uh, depending on what types of things you find, you have uh, you know different uh, ice that could be different levels of purity, and you can also, of course, come up with different technologies that would help to uh, you know maybe purify in certain ways as well. But I think the basic uh, idea is the more that's there, the better, and we can figure right. out how to use it uh, for for humans. Right, absolutely. Well, there we are, uh, Joe. Thanks so much for the news. That was super interesting, um, and. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to do the research and give us that story. It was really oh, well. As always, love being here and uh, love chiming in on anything space. So thank you guys for having me. So now we are talking with Dr. Margaret Landis, who is a postdoc at CU Boulder. She specializes in geology and icy bodies all over the solar system. She's worked with spacecraft like the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, the Dawn spacecraft that visited the dwarf planet Ceres, and now the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter at the moon. Current work looks at the chemistry of ices on the moon and how they could be essential in determining what sort of water reservoirs our future human explorers could access for drinking and farming and fuel and things like that. So thank you so much for joining us, Margaret. Thanks Ron, for having me. Yeah, for sure. So speaking of water on the moon, we have recently discovered that yes, there is a ton of water ice at the poles of the moon. Um, which is pretty exciting just as the thing, but as far as like upcoming missions and sending people to the moon, what is it about this polar water ice deposits that scientists are so excited about? I think from a scientific perspective, what's unique about the polar ice on the moon is it could potentially preserve a long-term record of the water delivery to the earth moon system, which would answer one of those big questions I talked about earlier, which is what is the source of the earth's water? Um, did it come from melting rocks that were already part of the earth or did it come from comets that were delivered later? Um, and so I think from a science perspective, that's really why we want to get at the quantity and composition of water ice on the moon. Um, from an engineering and mission operation standpoint, um, every kilogram you don't have to take with you is a kilogram saved, um, both in terms of of money and um, change in velocity to break Earth's orbit, but also maybe room for another science instrument or another person. Um, and so mass really matters in spacecraft missions and in human missions. And so there's this expectation that 
maybe astronauts um, could take a shovel out, dig up some water ice, and then have water both for um, human consumption, but potentially also for a uh, fuel source. So there's a lot of interest in trying to figure out um, the amount and the quantity and the purity of water ice, um, both on the Mars, uh, both on Mars and on the Moon. Imagine having to harvest your ice like that becomes a major season in your in your life. Oh, we have to go harvest some ice. All right, kids, let's go harvest the ice. Uh, speaking of harvest, the moon is a really dusty place. Uh, and I imagine that these ice reserves are not exactly pristine. Are there any things that we need to watch out for or consider before we start watering our moon veggies with this stuff? Um, one thing I kind of touched on before is that there are a lot of potential, so if comets played a major role in delivering water ice to the moon, that means that other organic contaminants are most likely also in the water. Um, the one I mentioned earlier was hydrogen cyanide. That's real bad if you're a person. Um, and so there are some other complex organics, um, especially particular types of hydrocarbons that are not safe for humans to consume large amounts of. So that's kind of another probably multi-million dollar question is how pure is the water ice? How much distillation are you going to have to do? Are you going to have to bring a, like basically a still with you to the moon to make sure that your water separates from other volatiles? Um, and then you mentioned how dusty the water ice is. So one thing that's kind of been interesting about looking at water ice on the moon is that there are data that suggests there's relatively pure water ice close to the surface of the moon. But there's other data sets like from neutron spectroscopy that suggests that the water ice most extensively is buried. And that's actually where your, your temperatures are going to be the best. So you can kind of think of the lunar regolith like a space blanket. And the more lunar regolith or layers of space blanket you put down, the colder actually the temperature is below the surface. And so some of the best places to preserve water ice on the moon are actually not on the surface, but below the surface, which means that you're going to have to either dig through regolith or um, dig up regular that has kind of water entombed within it to be able to actually get at it. So um, that's a really good question. I think it's a, a research question too, because it's, it's not clear. Um, the other thing that can happen is you can bury water ice deposits when you have small um, objects called micrometeorites hit the surface of the, the moon. And it's a lot like a raindrop on the earth kind of moving the, the dust around it. Um, that can happen on the moon with micrometeorites. And if you do that for long enough and you have enough micrometeorites, which on the moon, there's no atmosphere, so you get plenty, you can actually move the regolith side to side and potentially bury things that way. So odds are that the water ice on the moon is not particularly pure. Um, but if it is, that also tells us something, which means it was delivered to the moon very rapidly and there wasn't time for kind of these regolith layers to build up in it. So that's one way or another, we're going to get a cool science answer, even if it's an answer of, yeah, there's going to be a lot of challenges actually making it usable for human consumption. I have this picture in my brain of just like a couple of astronauts with like a pot boiling water like you do on top of a mountain. Like, I don't know why that just makes me laugh. I want to go back to this thing. I noticed you said it a couple times and pretty much everybody, every time we talk to people about the moon, they bring up this term lunar regolith not a common thing that most people are familiar with. Can you kind of define this regolith term and kind of why, why is it cool? Why, why do we care about regolith and what kind of things can we learn from lunar regolith? So regolith is a technical term. It's almost synonymous with soil, but my understanding is that the difficulty with saying soil or dirt is that it has this implication of um, biological processing which we do not want to make that claim anywhere else in the solar system other than when we know it's definitely happening. Um, and so regolith is kind of the substitute term. Um, it's generated when solid rock breaks down into smaller particles um, over time. This is something that happens on the earth. It happens anywhere where your nice poor rock is not very well shielded from weathering, which is everywhere, um, poor rocks. Um, but what ends up happening is you start breaking it down into smaller, smaller particles over time. Um, it can happen, uh, like on Mars, you can have wind blowing it around and that will start breaking down the particles. On the moon, it's a lot of uh, micrometeorite bombardment. Um, one thing that is particularly special about the lunar regolith is it doesn't have really significant processing from water. So um, geology 101, you go into the field and you're like, oh, this is like a rounded particle. This is a 
angular particle, this is a subangular particle. Um, and those variety of particles, shapes and sizes come from, at least on the Earth, processing from water. Um, that doesn't happen on the moon. So lunar regolith tends to have really sharp edges compared to regolith that we're used to on, the Mar or on Mars or on the Earth. And that's actually um, one pretty significant challenge in spacesuit design and other things is that there's, it's basically sharp glass that's hanging out on the surface of the moon. And it's potentially um, very hazardous, both in terms of uh, making sure your spacesuit's resistant to it, but also making sure people don't inhale it. Um, because small glass particles in your lungs are not really why you want small glass-like particles in general. Um, so that's one of the really kind of tough challenges at the moon that you wouldn't have at Mars um, is the right life. Um, and so, so yeah, the other kind of cool thing about regolith is depending upon its thermal properties, it can be really great at um, providing really cold subsurface temperatures like I mentioned earlier. Um, so what happens to these really small particles is that they're hard to pack together, which means it's harder to transfer heat. And if you don't have an atmosphere, then you don't have air pockets inside. And so you're basically relying on conduction instead of convection to transfer heat. And so you can really, get cold temperatures if you put enough layers of lunar regolith down. Um, so it's one thing that you might be able to survive in places on the moon that are hotter than you'd expect um, if you could somehow maybe like insulate a habitat with lunar regolith. Um, and you might be able to put volatiles below the surface in places on the moon or on Ceres that um, kind of push a little bit more the limits of where they would be versus like stable on the surface by doing that. So yeah, regolith is just a very, technical abiotic term for small bits of rock that have broken down to bigger bits of rock. I like the idea that it's such a good insulator. I, I went to a talk one time where someone was talking about uh, actually building habitats on Mars, but they were mentioning like basically using the, the soil and the dust to 3D print a habitat. And that would be, I feel like lunar regolith would be an excellent sort of thing to make a little habitat out. Make like a little, you know, dust igloo or something because it's such a good insulator. I, I, unfortunately, I'm not an engineer, so I don't understand that much about how exactly you 3D print it. But I've definitely heard that come up multiple times where you might be able to use the resources that are available to you as an astronaut um, in a lot of innovative ways. You know, finding ice on bodies in the solar system is a lot more complicated than just taking pictures of ice caps and snowfields, um, especially when a lot of that ice uh, that we know of that we've been talking about is underground. So you can't see it from space directly. Uh, what are some of the other ways that we can, you know, kind of infer uh, the, the existence of ice, you know, that we can't directly see? That's a really good question. Um, and one of the things early on in my PhD, the reasons I picked the polar layer deposits to study is that they were on the surface, surface of Mars and when they knew what, and we knew they were water ice. So it kind of reduced the complexity a little bit. Um, one thing that I think is really important to think about is looking at um, spectroscopic and geophysical data. Um, infrared spectroscopy, so generally with spectroscopy, you can, assume you can have, you can detect water at the depth that's like, if it's light based or radi or electromagnetic radiation based, you can assume that you can kind of understand it to depths that are about the wavelength of like the radiation you're using. So if it's infrared, it's, some, it's a certain wavelength. If it's um, near infrared or something that's shorter wavelength, it's, it's proportionately shallower that you can kind of tell that there's water ice near the surface. Um, that's one of the reasons why neutron spectroscopy is so cool. So instead of using electromagnetic radiation, it uses um, galactic cosmic rays that generate neutrons in the subsurface and then looks at how those neutrons come up through the surface and how different energies of neutrons are um, released from the surface in different ratios. And so you can get at how much water is there because water is really great at attenuating neutrons, so kind of blocking neutrons from escaping. Um, unfortunately, chlorine is too, so it always just takes, takes some effort and some art to be able to process that data correctly. Um, but that's a great way of doing it. Um, another way is just measuring the, the density of an object. Um, like I mentioned for Ceres, we knew something was up because the density was much lower than it should have been if it had been purely rock. So that's one thing that's helpful. Um, radar also is a great instrument and a great way of doing that because the, the radar signal um, depending upon its particular wavelength can um, 
penetrate fairly deeply into some water ice or other regolith bodies. That's how we've actually discovered a large amount of the surface or near surface water ice on Mars is we've actually just taken a radar across it and gone, oh yeah, so there's layering here in the, um, basically attenuation rate of the radar matches up really well with water or CO2 ice. So radar instruments are always very transformative. Um, trying to think what else is key for understanding um, buried ice. Um, another thing that's really helpful is if there are impact craters, um, they kind of scoop out an entire chunk of the regolith and you can actually expose the material that's below the surface. So um, my undergrad advisor always said that they're nature's drill or nature's um, soil profile trench because you uh, can dig a hole in the ground and you don't have to send anybody to go do it. It just happens because that's how the solar system works. Um, that's really helpful to look at. Uh, there's some really interesting work that's been coming out of the United States Geological Survey and the High Resolution Imaging Science Experiment that's actually looking at these cliffs on Mars that are exposing water ice. And so there are a lot of indirect ways. And then of course, one of the tried and true ways, which isn't definitive, but very suggestive is looking at the geomorphology. So what the landforms actually look like, um, because they're very distinctive um, landforms that form either in the presence of ice or that have formed as the result of ice moving through an area. So like if you've been up to Rocky Mountain National Park ever in Colorado, they are spectacular U-shaped valleys. And so instead of being a really sharp cut into the rock, it's nice and broad. That is a dead ringer for something that has, that's been icy that has flowed through there. Um, and that is something that we um, kind of can observe that if ice isn't there anymore, you can still kind of say, well, this is like a dead ringer for something that probably happened with an icy process. And then it can go back with other remote sensing techniques and then kind of follow up in these areas or at least understand the path presence of ice. Well, that kind of wraps up the official questions that we had for you, but we also have our Capcom Q&A segment that we like to do where we have some questions yeah. that were submitted by the public that we want to throw at you. Yep. Clayton from Houston asks, does the moon's orbit ever change slightly or is it very slowly moving towards us on an inevitable collision course? So my understanding is the moon is actually slowly moving away from us. Um, and the reason for that is kind of going back to the, the ice skater analogy um, for angular momentum in like physics 101, where the, if the ice skater's arms are out, it's a different kind of setup than um, if the ice skater's arms are in. And so what's happening with the moon is there is being energy transfer from the moon to actually the Earth's oceans through tides. Um, and so the moon, it, my understanding is it's slowly losing energy and eventually it's backing away from the earth. So on one hand, it means probably not a catastrophic impact with the earth, which as an impact person, I am both happy and sad about it at the same time because I, I like to live on the earth, but a giant impact would be really cool. Um, the immediate downside is that eventually we won't get full solar eclipses anymore. Um, we're in, living in a kind of an interesting time where the, the angular distance in the sky of the moon and the sun are such that you can actually completely cover the sun with the moon um, in, in the right solar eclipse setup. And eventually that's gonna go away. So I think, yeah, I think that the biggest thing to worry about is living in a world without solar eclipses, which on one hand seems really simple, but on the other hand, isn't it wild that like our moon can exactly eclipse the sun? Like there's, there's something to be said about living in a very specific and very interesting kind of orbital configuration with your moon like that. Not all the planets have that. I actually just saw some pictures published like a week ago maybe of um, a solar eclipse from Mars where it's two little tiny moons went in front of the sun and it was like, oh, that's adorable. <laughs> How cute, they block a little bit. Yeah, so I, I probably should correct myself and say, you can have a solar eclipse from basically anywhere with the moon that, cover, that will go over the sun, but like having a total solar eclipse is kind of is is a very unique thing and will eventually go away not not fast like i think we've still got at least in our lifetimes plenty of sol total solar eclipses but it's one of those things where you just kind of go oh that's i better see as many as i can before i die slash they go away well they're pretty powerful events and i can't remember whether it ended or started a war between it was uh it was between the greeks and the romans i think 
right? And there, you can, it's actually, we know exactly, it helped us know exactly when this moment in history was because they wrote down, the sun just turned black and the sky is dark. And it's the middle of the day and we think it's the gods telling us to, you know, do or don't do whatever it is that we were going to do. And now we're like, hey, that happened exactly here because we can run time backwards with math and say, all right. Uh, but yeah, it's, you know, witnessing it is very like, oh my gosh, it's kind of like. Yeah. One of the most interesting science memoirs I ever read, and I need to find out more about this author, as far as I can tell, was like a lady from Boston, and she somehow decided she wanted to see a total solar eclipse. And she ended up going, I think, to three different potential solar eclipse observations. And I think the first two either got rained out or there was weather or they were trying to go see it and then World War One happened. And oh she no. Saw a solar eclipse. This series of misadventures where she's just like, I just want to see a solar eclipse. And like, here's the travel log of how these things went wrong and we missed it this time. And she eventually saw one. But yeah, if there's not, it was at the beginning of the 20th century and there's not a lot of other information about her. I've been able to like find her in some like Daughters of the American Revolution records in Boston, but I don't know that much about her. So it's one of like my side projects whenever I have air quotes time um, to try to figure out exactly why she decided that she had to see a solar eclipse because it's one of those things where she it's my knowledge she's not an astronomer she's just a person who went these are really cool and i want to do this um so it was kind of a fun science memoir is is a i think a lay person who was just like yeah I'm, I'm, this is cool and i want to go see it i think that's an excellent metaphor for science in general it's like i think this thing is really cool here's all the times that i've been stopped from actually observing this here's all the reasons why this went horribly wrong and then world war one happened <laughs> like shoot all right well thank you so much for joining us today dr margaret landis yeah uh thanks again colin and tara for having me and it was a lot of fun chatting with you all about the moon All right, so now we are talking to Dr. Paul Hain, who is an assistant professor at CU Boulder studying surface and atmospheric processes on terrestrial bodies like the moon and Mars. He is especially interested in ices and how they affect the atmospheres of these bodies. Dr. Hain is involved with several NASA missions, including the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, or LRO, the Mars Climate Sounder, and the upcoming Europa Clipper. He is currently the lead on an instrument slated to be launched to the moon as a part of the Artemis series of missions. This radiometer will help map the distribution of different chemicals and materials on the moon and their thermal properties. Dr. Paul Hayden, thanks so much for being with us this morning. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. So the first question I want to ask you is uh, if you could give us a brief overview of this thing called the Artemis mission. Sure. So Artemis is actually a program uh, that intends to put a human back on the surface of the moon by 2024. So it'll actually be a, a sequence of, of missions culminating in uh, footprints, boot prints on the surface of the moon sometime in 2024 is the plan. Um, and also going to places that we haven't been before with humans or any other uh, robotic explorers, so like places like the South Pole of the Moon. Very cool. So this is the so when we refer to Artemis collectively, it is the series of missions that will occur in succession to put people back on the Moon. Right. So in NASA parlance, that would be a program. Okay. And each part of that program will consist of a mission or or sequence of missions. So, for example, um, one of the first missions is going to be to put something called the Lunar Gateway in orbit around the moon. This is a mini space station, sort of uh, a, a smaller version of the International Space Station. It's gonna go into orbit around the moon um, in a very special kind of orbit that will allow it to deposit things uh, on the lunar surface. Very cool. So, so we'll move into kind of what you're doing a little bit more here. Uh, you are leading the development of an instrument uh, called the Lunar Compact Infrared Imaging System, or LSIRIS, once we get to know it better, uh, that will ride on board one of the three landers associated with the Artemis program. What will this instrument do, and uh, what can we learn from its observations? Yeah, so LSIRIS is a camera, but it's sort of a night vision or heat sensing camera. So it's a thermal infrared camera 
um, that takes pictures just, just like your iPhone, um, but it's sensing wavelengths of light beyond human vision. So it's going to sense into the thermal infrared. So everything that we see with this camera will be the emitted radiation from the heat of all the objects around us on the surface of the moon. Um, and I say us, but really this, this is a robotic lander. There's no human beings on board and, and we have a fully automated camera system that's going to uh, generate these images. So once we land on the surface, uh, the instrument will then scan to make these sort of panoramic uh, images over and over again. So we can see how things change over the course of the lunar day. Uh, and our landing site is a very unique place. We don't have it picked out yet, <laughs> but it's gonna be a unique place um, near the South Pole of the moon. And uh, NASA or anyone else has, has never sent any, anything this close to the, the lunar poles. So uh, getting back to El Cirrus then, our, our instrument will sit on the lunar surface on this lander and it'll be um, right next to uh, one or more of these big permanently shadowed craters. And so we're going to take images of those, those craters for, for the very first time from the surface and map out where are these cold regions. I, I said that we can measure the heat. So we're gonna measure the temperature of these, these craters and see which ones are cold enough to trap ice. And then other instruments on the lander are going to actually search for that ice in those, those cold regions, including a little uh, rover, um, which is sort of like a little you know, toy rover, kind of like the Sojourner rover. I don't know if you're familiar with that on, on um, Mars Pathfinder. There was this little tiny rover that rolled off the, the lander. So we have one of those called Moon Ranger, and that's gonna rove around on the, on the surface exploring for, for ice also. So El Cirrus will help map out where that little rover should go to, to search for ice. Um, and then finally, we also learned something about the geology and the geologic history of the moon and the moon formation um, with El Cirrus because we have these compositional wavelengths that we use to look for, to look at the composition of, of the surface. So though in a nutshell, that's what El Cirrus is doing, mapping out the, the temperatures and the cold traps for water and looking at the, the composition and, and geologic history. What, just to get a feel for kind of what this process looks like, what, if you had to guess, what fraction of instruments go all the way from someone thinks about them to they end up on a planet or a body that's not the earth? <laughs> that number is very small. <laughs> is it? So it's, it's a very competitive, if you will, uh, uh, field to, to develop an instrument. And, and it is, it. but you have to keep in mind that, that nobody's just proposing once, right? So right. You know, we, we all propose over and over and over again. And that's one of the things I, I tell students especially is that the, the best way to succeed in, in astronomy and planetary science in any field is, is to, to fail <laughs> over and over again and, and, and get really good at failing. And by, what I mean by that is, is to um, accept the fact that, that failure is, is a part of the process and not let it hurt your feelings too much, you know? Um, it does hurt, of course it hurts. And you, you feel it and you say, okay, like that stung, what can I learn from this experience and, and move on to the next opportunity? Because if you ask anybody who, who you know, has an instrument that's, that's on another planet, they'll tell you that there's you know, a, f a floor somewhere littered, littered with you know, chunks and broken parts of instruments that, that failed. You know? So uh, that's, that's kind of the story there is that, yeah, it's a small, num small fraction, but um, most people, uh, eventually succeed. We, I'm going to kind of change directions here. Um, in astronomy, we often talk about uh, geologically active or inactive bodies, uh, meaning for the listeners that there uh, is or isn't seismic or volcanic activity occurring somewhere on the body, right? So you can think of this body, you know, a planet or a moon or asteroid being active or inactive. Um, and more and more, uh, the consensus is that it seems to me that, that the more we learn about all of these bodies that we thought were inactive, that there's not really such thing as a truly inactive body, that there is absolutely nothing happening on, you know, on, you know, some body in space. Um, what can be said about activity happening on the moon? Is there any activity happening on the moon that may impact uh, Artemis astronauts when they arrive, for example? So a lot of a lot of people do think of the moon as a relatively dead rock in space with not much activity. But 
in fact, we're starting to think that there is activity on the moon that, that may be ongoing today. And, and there, there's certainly um, external activity that is affecting the, the moon's surface, which will certainly uh, affect the Artemis astronauts uh, once they get there. So by that, I mean, there are meteorites hitting the surface of the moon constantly. You know, you can imagine the big impacts that produce craters and all that are pretty infrequent, but the impacts of the much smaller things, the kind of, of particles that we see produce uh, shooting stars, you know, meteors in our, in our sky, um, those are very common. And if, you know, if you're an astronaut on the surface and you've got your spacesuit, you know, which is protecting you from the, the vacuum of, of space, um, one of those little, you know, pebble-sized uh, projectiles is is a big deal, you know. So, so we we would like to know about that kind of activity, the external activity. There's also a lot of radiation activity in terms of of both from the sun, the solar wind, and uh, things like coronal mass ejections that introduce high energy particles um, from the sun, and then also galactic cosmic rays, which are constantly bombarding the lunar surface. These these things cause more long term damage. Although sometimes something like a CME can can trigger a, a power outage by, um, you know, discharging a, a whole um, circuit. So we do have to worry about the space environment affecting the the uh, activities on the, the lunar surface, not just for astronauts but also for our robotic emissaries. Um, and then there's also internal activity to the moon. So we we know from Apollo that uh, there is seismic activity both on the surface and in the deep interior of, of the moon, uh, triggered by moonquakes. And the way that those moonquakes in the deep interior are, are, are triggered is, is probably due to the interaction with Earth, which is pretty interesting, actually. As, as the moon moves around in its orbit around the Earth, the moon creates tides on the Earth, but the, the Earth also creates tides on the moon. And because the Earth is creating tides on the moon, that's causing some kind of squeezing and, and flexing inside the moon, which then uh, makes faults form and slip. So those, those deep moon quakes are, are mostly probably triggered by, by that kind of activity, which is ultimately the cause of, of the Earth and, and not really because of the moon's own activity, right? Um, but there are, there's, there's some, some of those moon quakes did not really match up with, with that kind of tidal forcing. And so we think there is some deep seismic activity on the moon that's caused by the moon's own internal motions or activity, um, maybe even because of, of some regions that are still melted from the formation of the moon, which is pretty surprising after um, you know four billion years that, that it would still be uh, molten down there, but it looks like at least part of it is. Um, and then finally, uh, there's some evidence for volcanic and tectonic activity, meaning um, eruptions and also uh, faulting at the, the, the surface from data from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. So we see a, a few of these features. Um, one is called INA, I-N-A. And if you haven't seen a picture of INA, you should look it up. It's beautiful and stunning and, and mysterious. So it's, it's a uh, clearly a volcanic eruption feature. It's some kind of volcano lots of this, what we call pancake batter, uh, blo blobby material on the surface. And uh, if, you if you take account of all the craters on those, those features, you can kind of tell their age, at least in a relative sense. And they look very young, like maybe less than 10 million years, which is a blink of an eye in geologic terms. And so people have put forward the idea that maybe those things are, were not only active 10 million years ago, but they're active today. And that would be very surprising, you know, given how old and cold we think the moon is. So uh, if there's volcanic activity today, that's something that the Artemis missions could definitively identify and, and, and for the first time, you know, say, yes, the moon is volcanically active today or, or no, it's not. And that would tell us about the whole history of its formation and, and its interior. Um, and also, lastly, you know, we, we see lots of evidence in the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter camera data for um, landslides and things, uh, new fresh impacts, big craters that are formed, you know, uh, um, by literally 
impacts that are happening before our eyes, basically. And uh, that will, you know, those larger impacts would definitely pose a hazard to, to astronauts on the surface. Wow, so it sounds like the moon is very much not dead, you know, as, as it, you kind of think about it sometimes, you know, like, oh, you know, this moon's just a rock in space, but it's really, there's a lot going on there, it sounds. Lot going on. <laughs> Interesting. Is there any consideration as to like, you know, we're sending astronauts to the moon, this is something that we talk about also with Mars, you know, when we get to that point, we have to deal with, you know, radiation that we haven't really, you know, dealt with before, and how are we going to deal with that? Is that conversation happening about putting people on the moon? Did it happen also in Apollo, you know, in that era? Yes, it is. And it's a, a big concern. I think a lot of people have spent their entire careers studying how to mitigate and uh, deal with, with radiation exposure for astronauts. Um, we deal with this all the time, by the way, for uh, robotic spacecraft because we have to protect our electronics and, and the inner workings of, of the instruments as they fly through space over a long period of time, you know, and we've been successful with that. Like, you know, for example, there's still instruments operating on, on Voyager, you know, and those spacecraft are, are now in interstellar space. So you can, you can do this for decades. The key is that you just need enough shielding between the environment of space and, and your body, right? Or your electronics as the case may be. So um, that's, that's challenging, you know, because you, you need a spacesuit to be able to, to be, um, maneuverable, right? You have to be able to, to work. And so um, you can't completely shield with, with just a spacesuit alone. So long-term exposure, which we didn't really encounter in Apollo because those missions were, you know, on timescales of days, not uh, months or years, that kind of radiation exposure for over a long period of time is, is a big concern. And a lot of people think that the, the moon is a good testing ground or proving ground for the kinds of technologies that people have been developing to help mitigate um, radiation exposure, um, and also to understand the, the effects on, on the body, because you know we have a lot of experience on the International Space Station with long-term uh, um, exposure to the low Earth orbit environment, but that's very, very different from um, even the moon or, or especially inter, uh, interplanetary space out um, on the way to Mars. So um, once you're on the surface of Mars, the situation is a little bit better than on the moon, but um, not a whole lot. And so it's, it's a very similar problem. Um, and yeah, the key is, the key is shielding and, and limiting the time out on the surface, basically. So we're going to switch a little bit now because we always like to get a little personal with our interviews there at the end. Um, and I definitely wanted to ask you about this really awesome thing. That no more you questions. <laughs> <laughs> Not that kind of person. <laughs> but no, I wanted to ask you about um, the Ad Astra Academy that you work with. It's super cool. Can you tell us a little bit about kind of their mission and, and the kind of things that you do with Ad Astra? Yeah, so Ad Astra is an organization that we founded in 2015 uh, to work with underserved students in uh, mainly developing countries, but also in the US, um, who are not exposed to cool science. <laughs> and so that's, that's basically the gist of it, is to get kids involved in not only learning about science, but doing science. And we like to involve them directly in NASA missions and you know research uh, cruises with you know research boats and, and that sort of thing. Um, and to get them to tap into their natural curiosity that otherwise, you know, we think would, would basically go dormant, we want to awaken it and, and give them opportunities that, that they wouldn't normally have. And so we involve, you know, NASA scientists and, um, you know, researchers who are working direct, directly with these NASA missions and, and biological uh, missions and stuff to, um, to help the students look at real actual science data. And, you know, for example, um, we had the students in the first, uh, first program in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil in 2015, we had them uh, request images from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter high-rise camera of locations on Mars that had never been imaged at that resolution. So no one had ever seen an up-close shot of that location on Mars. And so they had to come up with a science justification for 
you know, why they wanted to, to study this place on Mars that had never been seen before and, and the whole, you know, research plan for what they were going to do with it. And then they proposed it to the NASA uh, team and then uh, the images were acquired. Um, we did a big unveiling ceremony and they got to like, you know, look at the images for the first time and then do their, their um, mock rover to reverse across the image, um, you know, studying the, the surface in more detail. So, so that sort of thing. And, and also just doing uh, hands-on activities outside of the classroom that they normally don't um, get a chance to do. So we, we build like a scale model of the solar system. We um, take them on a, a field trip that's usually either uh, biology or geology oriented, um, which is something these kids, you know, typically don't have any opportunity to do. And, and um, we've been pretty successful in, in encouraging students not not just to become scientists because we're not naive. We don't think that everyone's going to become a scientist, but but to at least you know pursue that interest and and uh, maybe think about you know studying science and at the university level. So right now we've we've done programs in Brazil several times and uh, Bangladesh and um, Oakland, California, and um, Nigeria, and we are looking to expand. During the year of COVID, we're looking to expand more locally uh, in in uh, the U.S., including um, juvenile detention centers in Colorado. That is fantastic. Like hearing you talk about this program is just awesome. Well, uh, Dr. Paul Hain, thank you so much for speaking with us. It was super interesting to hear about the science that you're working on, and uh, it's exciting to look forwards into the future about these you know, this program, the Artemis program, and also perhaps getting to Europa's ocean. So thanks a lot for your time. Yeah, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. All right, that's our episode for today. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Uh, be sure to come back next week. We have Dr. Louis Zay and Dr. Bruce Jakoski, who are going to be talking to us about all sorts of astrobiology, asteroid mining, weird space life stuff. It's going to be really exciting. We definitely also want to thank our guests for this week, Dr. Margaret Landis and Dr. Paul Hain for giving us some really cool information about the moon. Now, of course, those are just excerpts from our full interviews. So if you want to hear the full extended interview with either of those, you want to check out our YouTube and SoundCloud accounts. You can find those there. Uh, and as always, we are available on YouTube and SoundCloud, but also Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And be sure to like and subscribe and comment and do whatever you need to do to make sure that you don't miss any of our upcoming episodes. We also want to invite you to check out our website, www.colorado.edu slash FISC. Uh, there you can see our schedule of upcoming shows and topics and guests. There's also an option for you to submit questions for our Capcom Q&A section so we can pass those on to our experts and maybe get them answered on the air. So you can send us a message to our email, fiskpodcast at colorado.edu, or check out the form there on our website. Otherwise, that's it for this week. Hope to see you guys next week.